Next up is Dharmendra Moda. He's the manager of the Cognitive Computing Group at IBM. Dharmendra, thank, thank you. you Good morning, everyone. So the question has come up, what is mind? We don't have a specification for the mind, but we understand it as a set of processes of sensation, perception, action, cognition, emotion, and interaction. The human mind has an amazing ability to integrate information across vision, audition, touch, taste, smell, and to create a coherent picture of world categorized into time, space, and object. We have no computer today that can even remotely mimic the abilities of the human mind. Mind arises from the brain. So if we would like to emulate the capabilities of the mind, I argue we must do it by simulating the brain. To put it differently, if you'd like to engineer the mind, the approach is to reverse engineer the brain. This is what we call cognitive computing. Sitting atop of the hill at Almaden, 14 miles south of here, my group and I are engaged in a modest goal. <laughs> Understand and build a brain as cheaply and quickly as possible. <laughs> so, as you can tell, this is not really a project, it's a quest. And as with any quest, timing is everything. So, this brief talk is to outline to you why timing now is perfect. So I would like to tell you three hard trends whose intersection now makes it feasible to embark on this quest. First trend is inflection point one, neuroscience, which is a very, very hard field to make progress in has now matured. If you look at the classic text in neuroscience, Principles of Neural Science by Eric Condell, the Nobel laureate, and his colleagues, it has swollen from its first edition of 400 pages to about 1,400 pages. So it sort of chronicles the rise of knowledge in neuroscience. So one of the prime actors uh, in neuroscience are the neurons. What you see here is what's called a classical pyramidal cell. This is the body of the neuron. The tree-like structure that you see brings input from about 8,000 neighboring neurons to the body of the neuron. The scale here is 100 microns. These are very tiny things. The purple line that you see coming out is the output line of the neuron, exon. It comes back and again forms a tree-like structure here, not shown. Now the idea is that each neuron receives inputs from about eight to 10,000 neighboring and distant neurons and projects its output to another eight to 10,000 different neurons. So this is a vast interconnect, interconnected network of neurons. And the key, it seems, is not really the neurons, but the synapses. Synapses are, this is a synapse, it's a junction between the output line of one neuron, called the exon, and the input line of another neuron, called the dendrite. The conduction from here up to the synapse is electrical, through the synapse is chemical, and again electrical through the body. The connection is directed, okay? So with respect to the synapse, we can talk of a presynaptic and a postsynaptic neuron, and what the synapses do is their synaptic strength, the synaptic efficacy, their weight, 
changes through time as the animal experiences the environment. So all that we are, our mother's sweet smile, taste of chocolate, it's all the we are independent of the species, but the individual human being is stored in the strengths of the synapses. Now here I outlined for you sort of a typical brain. The crinkly folded surface you see here is the cerebral cortex, the neocortex, and the light comes from retina, goes through a central relay station, and from there goes to the cortex. The different colored areas that you see are functionally differentiated areas throughout the cortex dealing with different senses, different motor outputs, different high-level planning areas, so forth, okay? So now cortex, if you open up the surface and lay it out, it's actually a two plus epsilon dimensional technology. So it's about 2,400 square centimeters, and it's about two to three millimeters thick. And what you see here is a slice through the two to three millimeter thickness of the cortex. And what you see is that the cortex is divided into laminas or layers or stratas of neurons, six of them organized sort of horizontally, and locally, the connectivity within the cortex called the gray matter connectivity is statistical. There is not enough information in our DNA for this connectivity locally within the cortex to be deterministic. And we now know, thanks to the work of a lot of neuroscientists, the statistical constraints on the cortical microcircuitry. And the good news, it seems, is that the cortical microcircuitry seems to be sort of roughly essentially the same in mammals, going from mice, rat, cat, monkey, humans, to even elephants and whales, as well as it seems within a brain, it seems to be essentially the same across areas of sensation, perception, cognition, so forth. So that puts forth a very promising hypothesis that perhaps there is a universal canonical microcircuit that we can hope to reverse engineer. Now, I ta told you about the local gray matter connectivity. How about the long distance white matter connectivity? What you see here is actually an atlas of the monkey brain that we took, converted to an Excel spreadsheet, and a different <laughs> So, you know, so this is really what computer scientists can bring to neuroscience, right? We take this vast amount of data, you know, what you see here, each little colored region is one particular, you know, region in the brain. What you're looking at here is the frontal lobe, and, you know, as, as I sort of, as the whole slide slid, you could see all the different lobes. Now, you know, this is the monkey uh, atlas, and what you see here is a slightly higher mammal, which is me. <laughs> Uh, this is the wiring diagram of sort of my brain. I went to Stanford, you know, via our collaboration with Professor Brian Wondell, and this is an MRI image of my brain, and you see that we are now able to trace out long distance white matter pathways in a particular person's brain. So, to summarize the first inflection point, the basic components, the neurons from rats, synapses from rats, local connectivity from cats, you know, sort of atlases from monkeys, and global connectivity from humans. We have the ingredients. We have all the ingredients, but do we have a big enough pot to cook the dish? Okay. That's the next trend. Well, supercomputing meets the brain. So if, so question I ask is, is it possible, is it, just think about, is it possible to put together a mammalian scale simulation in real time. So now we have to go from neuroscience to computer science. What are the three primary metrics of computer science? Well, it's memory, computation, and communication. And the question is, does there exist in the intersection of memory, computation, and communication a machine and an algorithm to put together a mammalian scale simulation, okay? So let's examine it. So what you see here, mouse, rat, human. Mouse, you know, all mammals have two hemispheres. 
It has 8 million neurons in one hemisphere, so about 16 million neurons in two hemispheres. Rat has about 56 million neurons, and humans have about 22 billion neurons. Each neuron makes about 8,000 synapses, so 128 billion synapses, about half a trillion synapses in rat, and, you know, 220 trillion synapses in humans. Now, if you look at all the three metrics of communication, computation, and memory, what you see is that these metrics scale not as number of neurons, but as number of synapses. So neural networks is a wrong term. We are really synaptic networks, okay? Now here, on this side, what I show is a blue gene that we unveil. This is the last version of blue gene, you know, with 32,768 processors and about eight terabytes of main memory. And if you compare it to the amount of computation we estimate would be required for the rat brain, assuming, okay, this is very important to understand, assuming a certain dynamical complexity of neurons and synapses. You can make each neuron so complex to simulate that no computer would be enough, okay? So this has to be very clearly understood. Assuming a certain complexity of synapses and neurons, well, it seems maybe it is possible to put together a rat scale simulation in near real time. Well, it's not a dream. We just made it happen a few months ago and published a paper in supercomputing conference where we are able to achieve 10 times slower than real time on this machine, a rat scale simulation. Okay? So now, as you look back, you know, so this, this, is a, this is a movement that makes you pause. So we look back at the history. So in 1956, you know, a team of IBM scientists put together a very large scale simulation with 512 neurons. So we have come a long way. Okay? So the question is, how far is human scale? If the scaling that you know, Justin Ratner talked about continues, right, assuming, so the question is, human scale in real time, if, when, right? I think, okay, assuming a very simple complexity of neurons and synapses, perhaps that's sufficient for computation, somebody, somewhere, we hope, using an IBM supercomputer, I gotta put a plug. <laughs> May be able to achieve a human scale simulation in 2018. Once again, you know, just uh, to caution you against James Miller, I don't want you to rearrange your portfolio yet. That's just <laughs> this is just human scale. It doesn't mean that it exhibits any kind of intelligence. Okay, so it just says that the scaffolding in terms of the raw computation power exists. It's essentially building a tool. It's essentially building the linear accelerator of cognitive computing. Now what we do with it, what kind of atoms do we smash together, and does cognition arise? That is the hard question that we need to answer. Okay? Now the problem is, now let's, let's turn a bit speculative. Let's see if this works. This really works. Well, there are a couple problems. First is, I don't know about you, but I would find it terribly inconvenient to carry a supercomputer around. And second is, I don't have the money to buy it for my own, okay? So, that's where inflection point three, nanotechnology meets the brain, okay? So let's look at the power of a rat brain. It's amazing, it's just 50 millivolts. And it's a very tiny thing. The rat cortex is about six square centimeters. Whereas we need, you know, 16 racks of supercomputer, 32,768 processors, eight terabytes of main memory, half a megawatt of power, right? So really, the computing architecture that we are pursuing as humankind and the computing architecture that the brain has evolved are very different. And it really is a meaningful question, is can we learn not just about cognition, from the mind and the brain, but can we learn about the novel architectures for computing from the brain, okay? It turns out we can. And I will not belabor this, but the real reason why the power 
et cetera, of the current architectures are so high is because of the, non, of the von Neumann architecture paradigm that we are on. And the brain is not a von Neumann architecture. So once again, you know, these are three metrics of the brain. You know, number of synapses per square centimeter are about 10 to the 10, so 10 billion. There are about a million neurons per square centimeters and certain amount of communication. And it is possible today to put together a crossbar array with about 10 to 10 intersections per square centimeter. So it is possible, in principle, to make this happen. Also, you know, this will give you about 500 transistors per neuron. So I mean, it's not fancy, but it's not bad. This can happen, okay? So, so really, you know, we, given these three inflection points, neuroscience, supercomputing, and nanotechnology, we can now address, you know, the vision of the three pioneers of computing. You know, this is George Bull, who gave us the binary logic. This is Alan Turing, who gave us the very notion of what it means to compute, the limits of computation. And this is John von Neumann, who gave us the computational architectural principles. It's very telling that these three pioneers were interested at the end of their careers, or perhaps all throughout, in how the brain works. So this is the holy grail, okay? So now, as I summarize, if you take neurons from rats, synapses from rats, local connectivity from cats, atlases from monkeys, long distance connectivity from humans, put it on a supercomputer to understand it, burn it into novel non one diamond chips, what do you think will happen? And that's the question that we're all here. So I think this is what will happen. <laughs> so to end on a serious note, so to end on a serious note, you know, cognitive computing, which is the quest to engineer the mind by reverse engineering the brain is a truly promising approach and technology that can transform the very foundations of the productivity and security of this society, this nation of human civilization. And really all of you can become investors, not just with money, but with your time, with your attention, with your energy, with your hopes, aspirations, and ambitions. So please join me in making this reality come sooner than later. Thank you very much. We have time for one question, Darmond. Okay. It seems to me that your simulation is gonna have the statistical properties of a brain, but it's not going to be thinking about anything at all because there's no uh, meaningful initial conditions in this simulation. Absolutely correct. It's, you know, the simulation as we have put together is just a brain in a black box. And what you have to do is you have to be able to provide sensory inputs and motor outputs to the simulation to make it real. So we are engaged in building a virtual environment to which we interface this machine too. But as I said, you know, we are no, you are in no threat of rearranging your portfolio soon. And just to understand the nonlinear dynamics of these extremely large scale simulations where so many elements are interacting with each other is a challenge in and of, of itself. So, you know, so yes, it's possible to do, it's not very difficult, but, and I understand, yes. So, well, thank you very much and have a, have a uh, great afternoon. Thank you so much. I